So let's talk physics. Take me to the frontier of particle physics today. What's going on at CERN now that the Higgs boson is discovered and the Nobel Prizes were granted? Mm -hmm. uh, what are they doing now? Well, at, at Did they CERN, just close shop and go home? <laughs> no. I mean, what, what particle physics is, because we're talking about quantum mechanics, basically, it's statistical in the sense that so you collide. What we do there is collide protons together at high energy. And we collide a lot of protons together <laughs> at high energy. Protons have a charge so that you can put them in a magnetic field and accelerate them yeah. to very high speeds. Yeah, so, so they go around. So the LHC in kilometers is 27 kilometers, and that's the number in, I was asking. circumference. Yes, yeah, uh -huh. so that's about 16 miles or something like that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and the, the protons go around that ring uh, 11,000 times a second. So that's how fast they go. Mm. That's fast. So that's 99.999999% okay. the speed of light. Okay, so you, you've granted them energy so that when you collide them, you break them apart. You're basically deconstructing nature you to do. see what residue comes out of it. When I think of doing that for anything else, it's gonna break, right? I don't take chairs and slam them together and still have chairs. I have a pile of of kindling, okay? So who ever thought it was a good idea to smash nature into itself? Well, um, I suppose Ernest Rutherford initially. Um, so we go back to Manchester, the turn of the 20th century, and Rutherford was using uh, Ernest, Ernest radioactive Rutherford. decay yeah. uh -huh. to um, essentially produce the particles. I mean, it's just the, the, decay, of, the decay of atomic nuclei that naturally happens to produce high energy particles which he then fired into gold foil and bounced them off the foil. In doing that, he discovered the atomic nucleus. So you, one way to think about particle physics is that you, when, when you collide things together, what are you doing? You, you're really building a microscope. One way to think of it is that the higher the energy of the collision, the, the, the faster these things are traveling, uh, the, smaller the, the, the smaller the object you can see. So we were talking about seeing for the first time in those experiments the atomic nucleus. Um, you move forward to the, um, you, well, ultimately through the 50s and 60s, and we have higher and higher energy collisions, you start seeing that the nucleus is made of protons and neutrons. And then you start seeing it in the 50s and 60s that the protons and neutrons are made of smaller things called quarks. And so we discover those. That we've not discovered anything smaller than that, by the way. Is it because you don't have so, enough energy to bust well, up a quark? Yes, well, well or, or to resolve what's inside it, let's say, to build a microscope. Because right now, the inventory of fundamental particles includes quarks. Yeah. So somebody so, saying that's fundamental, which sounds a little like the Greeks yeah, saying yeah. atoms are fundamental. Oh no, well, they, they won't be fundamental, you're absolutely right. But, uh, but they look point-like from the, from the point of view, that, from the energies that we can generate today. But that, that's one side of particle physics. So we've been exploring the structure of matter, which is historically, you know, it goes back to Rutherford, I suppose. And again, you have confidence that when you break matter apart, you didn't break the matter. You're just deconstructing it. Yeah, you're, you're, it really, I think the way to think about it, I mean, you think about what a collision is. So let's say you collide, as we did at, in my PhD, electrons and protons together. So you get an electron beam and a proton beam, and you smash them into each other, what's actually happening? What's actually happening is one way that the collision can happen is that the electron can emit a photon, which is a particle of light. And the particle of light goes, and it, and it, and it hits the, uh, the proton. Now, the, the wavelength of that light, which is which telling you how small a thing you can see, is proportional to the energy of the thing. That's how hard we're smashing the things together. So the well, faster you smash them together, yeah. So the, yeah. Fa the, the faster you smash together, the higher the energy, the smaller the smaller wavelength. wavelength. So right. the smaller the things that you can see. So so that's a way of thinking about particle collisions. So it, it really is a microscope in that sense. Okay. That analogy works. I'm just thinking, if, if I were a proton, I wouldn't want to be busted apart into quarks. That would not be a nice day for well, me. In some ways, I suppose it's like having it's kind of like having an X-ray. I suppose, isn't it? <laughs> oh, you're right, though. You hit them hard enough, and they fall to bits. But that would be the same for you. <laughs> <laughs> if, so, but we, we would try not to hit yeah, you Yeah, except hard what I'm, the bits that <laughs> I fell into, no one's considered them fundamental <laughs> no. bits of Neil. But, right. But the other way to think about particle physics, which is, I think, so you say the Higgs particle you mentioned. So that's not in the proton. 
you're not you're not smashing the things together and finding a Higgs particle buried in there somewhere. The other side is really so you think about Einstein's famous equation E equals mc squared. So energy and mass are interchangeable. Let's put it like that. So it also says that if we have loads of energy in these collisions, then we can make new particles that are extremely massive, much more massive. That would come spontaneously out of the available energy that yeah. would otherwise be, be doing nothing. Yeah. So, so we have, uh, when you collide protons together at these energies, you have plenty of energy there to make a Higgs particle, for example, uh, or a top quark, which is a very heavy particle as well, far more massive than the protons. So, so that's. I suppose the way to think about trying to manufacture Higgs particles so you can observe them, you need enough energy to make them. So you're not just busting them apart, you're creating an opportunity to view more massive particles than would otherwise be available to you. Yeah, and the other thing to say, so to get a complete picture, is these very massive things like Higgs particles, um, that they, they have a very short lifetime. So you make them and they decay away into lighter particles very, very fast, so you don't see the Higgs particle. What you see are the, are the, the debris from the decay of the Higgs particle. And the, 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 the challenge of particle physics is to get, pit, detect all those bits that came off, basically. And uh, by the way, you also have the bits of the protons that all got smashed up as well. So it's a big mess. And we have more than... I've we don't seen just these have one these, these... It's very hard because you, you don't only have one proton collision per... We, we, we send the particles around in little bunches, basically. So you can get 10, 20, 30 collisions at the same time. Only one of them on a very good day will be an interesting one. Uh, and, and then, so you've got to sift through all this, which is the, the, the difficulty or the professional challenge, let's say, of particle physics. With that reasoning, there's always some next energy level that you haven't well, visited. Yes. Where so, more and interesting physics can reveal itself. And this is where it gets um, challenging at the moment, because so the the so-called standard model Higgs particle. And I should just say for a minute, that, that thing, the existence of this thing was predicted in the 1960s by Peter Higgs and others. And um, it was a suggestion, a theory, a guess, let's say at the time, mathematically motivated, almost purely, by the way, mathematically motivated, of how things get mass in the universe at the most fundamental level. So how the quarks and the, these these very heavy things called the W and Z bosons, that how, how those things got mass. Um, and so it was a, a mathematical construct. It predicted that there should be, a, in the simplest case, one, this thing, the Higgs boson, but there could be more, more complicated versions. And so we knew that if we collided protons together at the energies that we generate at the Large Hadron Collider, then we would either discover the Higgs boson and prove this theory to be correct. Or we knew that if it wasn't there, we would see something else. So we had a very clear idea from experiment and theory that we were going to discover something with that machine. And you don't know what it is. It turned out it was the simplest thing. Mm -hmm. It was this thing that Peter Higgs had, had dreamt of all those years ago, which is astonishing, by the way, 50 years after the prediction. And there's a, there's a great essay that you might know by Eugene Wigner called The Unreasonable well, Effectiveness of, of Mathematics, mathematics yes. in Physical Sciences. Yeah. I think that's the, one of the best examples. It's an astonishing achievement mm -hmm. that we got it right. And so, so we discover the Higgs boson. To put precision on that, that Wigner's yeah. the point in that paper, it's not that math in a vacuum, no pun intended, makes discoveries. It's the mathematical representation of a physical idea yeah and then you pursue the math and it applies to the universe but only if the physical idea is has captured reality in some yeah. fundamental way Al although there were, it was i think the it was a, a very a very mathematical framework which became the standard model of particle physics based on ideas of symmetries and all sorts of beautiful ideas mm. which, which really do have mathematical foundations. So there's an aesthetic sense, I think, built into that model. And that would be well. the pure mathematical. See, I'm, you know, my people in astrophysics, we have enough embarrassing historical examples of chasing 
Well, you know, elegance and the beauty. Kepler. Kepler, I'm saying. But, Look at Kepler. But the, I, I think the genius of Kepler, Kepler. is that he had these platonic solids and these ideas. Right, he's got a, the, the pyramid and the cube and the this. And but the, then he rejected the, it based yeah. on data. Uh, yes. In but, 16... But his, his first thought was, was the universe is beautiful and divine and perfect, and these the solids are perfect, the planets are in the universe, mm. so it must be a connection. Yeah, he spent uh, 10 years looking at it. Yeah, but then... But then he rejected it. The, yes. And then the laws of planetary motion, which, which are indicative of a very beautiful thing, which is Newton's law of gravitation, the inverse square law. Yeah. And so there is a, there's a beauty underlying it. But only after he had to scrap this other beauty that he had presumed it would be. That's why we, we, we step lightly when someone says, I have this beautiful idea. Yeah, yeah okay, let's hear it. But, but, it, but it is true, that I, and I think it's one of the great mysteries, that, that, that there is... Um, Historically, Einstein's theory of general relativity is another example where, where a quest for simplicity and beauty and elegance, which are judgments, right, the human judgments, has led to very, very precise models of the way that nature works. 